Hi, everybody. Welcome back from the morning session. I hope you all enjoyed Dr. Joshi. We just down here, we just thought he was wonderful and, and really what, what, what great advice and, and great tools I think he gave us. So t for, before we begin, I want to thank our Saturday night sponsor, Recology. Uh, for those of, since we're virtual this year, uh, when you have dinner at home on Saturday night, say a word of thanks to Recology. And uh, now we're going to show you a nice video about Recology. I want to start by thanking all our employee owners for your incredible displays of courage, dedication, and humility as we navigate an unprecedented situation. Drivers, sorters, maintenance employee owners, your brave and steady presence in the community during this pandemic has provided a critical and much needed glimmer of normalcy. I'm so proud of your hard work during this challenge and I'm heartened to see the public recognize your heroics through both big national television coverage and small things like thank you notes on the pavement and chalk written by neighborhood children a couple of times that I've been out to visit with Dave Pretari our local collector neighbors have come to the windows smiled waved encouraged to see that something normal is happening in their lives Thank you, Recology. Thank you for your longtime support of the Sam Redwood City Chamber and the uh, Progress Seminar. Our 1130 panel is titled San Mateo Strong, Emergency Response in Time of Crises. We've got three great panelists here today. Uh, Mike Callagy, who is the county manager, San Mateo County Manager. Louise, Ro Price, Louise Rogers, who is the chief of San Mateo County Health Services, and Roseanne Faust, who is the CEO of, 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 um, of, of Sam Cita. And so um, we're going to kick it off and begin with Mike Callagy and, and ask Mike to talk a little bit about the uh, brand new San Mateo uh, Oper regional Operations Center and how that has helped during this, this time that we are now in. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Groom. Great to be here. Uh, great to be here with all of you. Uh, wish we were in person, but it's been that kind of year. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, the foresight of the, of the Board of Supervisors couldn't have been better when uh, we uh, allocated money uh, from the board to uh, build that regional operations center. It literally opened three months prior to this pandemic. And quite frankly, I don't know what we would have done without it. It became the, the really the, uh, the nerve center of this entire uh, county as far as coordination of resources and, uh, and really getting um, people together to do the work that was necessary in the very early stages of this. And we had really not even had enough time to practice in this building. This building was brand new uh, for all practical purposes uh, when this pandemic hit. And uh, uh, I can still remember the very first day that, uh, that we opened it. And, and I got to tell you that it was amazing. And it really goes back to people, you know, brick and mortar is terrific. And this building is beautiful, but it really goes back to the people that occupy that building and the brave men and women who went in in the early days really not understanding the full impact of a pandemic, this, this COVID-19 and how it spread or any of those things, but they knew that they had to do a job 
And, uh, and they went in there and did that. And when you think about that, you know, I, I just want to commend um, Ileana Rodriguez, uh, deputy county manager who became really the commander of the EOC and operations over uh, um, planning and financial and uh, logistics and operations. And, and that really became the center of how our response to this uh, COVID-19 crisis started. But we're able to have, um, because of that building and the unique way it was set up, we were able to have the medical uh, folks in there at the same time um, with all of the, uh, the planning. Uh, and we were able to also utilize that building uh, to get out the message to, to be as transparent as possible and to bring all our elected officials in the county together with daily information and updates which really kept them in the loop. But it was a place that, you know, we scoured literally the world for PPE. We were in competition for, with everyone else in the country for PPE, and that was where it was all occurring right there. And it was heartbreaking to make deals and then see deals broken only for more money. Um, it was a place we dealt with uh, the homeless crisis that was, uh, that was going to uh, be unraveling uh, as this... Uh, pandemic started to unfold. It was a place where businesses were shut down and where we, they gathered information and we stood up and we were one of the first to stand up um, uh, the attorney hotline where people can come in and get information. In fact, we had other counties calling our attorneys asking them about what this uh, meant. It was a place where we stood up the first COVID-19 hotel in the state, maybe in the country, where we could bring overflow of uh, folks. It was a place that we were able to uh, utilize to stand up um, at our, with our great partners at the event center, the, the mobile hospital setting. Everything that we did uh, in addressing the, you know, food insecurity and uh, homelessness and all the things around uh, the beginning of this pandemic occurred there. Uh, you know, at one point in time, we probably had well in excess of 150 people working out of that, um, out of that one site. And it really allowed for the coordination and the quick response that we needed in the early days to really get out in front of this uh, uh, this pandemic that really there was no roadmap for or playbook for that uh, that we had uh, to respond to in a very quick manner. So let me stop there, and uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions later on when we get to that part. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to move to Louise Rogers now, who is the chief of San Mateo County Health System and Services, and she's going to talk about the pandemic that we are now um, experiencing and what the health department and, and all of her teams of doctors and nurses and social workers are working on. Louise, welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Groom. Um, I, I really just want to appreciate that recology film and how uh, those puppies and that job where you get to sit there holding those puppies. Anyway, um, that's not where I've been for the last few months. Um, as you all know, we've been holding down the fort in the response to the pandemic. And um, I, I love the progress seminar as sort of an opportunity to reflect. Uh, but I do today want to start out with a message that's really more about kind of where we are in the here and now. Uh, in response to the pandemic. And that is, uh, you know, that we're, we're very concerned uh, about the uptick that we're seeing in the cases, uh, not just uh, in San Mateo County, but really in the Bay Area, which is, we're part of a larger ecosystem and across California and also the nation. And, and to put that into perspective, um, you know, last week uh, we assigned uh, 459 new uh, cases to contact tracers um, to follow up on. And um, the week of October 11th, uh, we only had 201 cases that we had to assign out. So that was actually one of our lowest weeks um, for, for the whole duration of the pandemic in, in October. And now we've had an uptick. So uh, what I wanna make sure everyone is thinking about as we approach Thanksgiving and the holidays is really, uh, we, we know that with vigilance and caution, uh, we can all work together to maintain the progress that we've seen locally uh, in San Mateo County over the last months, getting to the orange tier and being able to open more of our businesses up. And so we have sent out a message with our partners in the Bay Area, the other counties, that really encourages uh, that holiday gatherings um, are, uh, we're using the theme safe, small, short, and stable. 
So safe is really get outdoors, wear your sweaters, wear your face covers and, and, and spend time outside with your loved ones rather than trying to have large indoor events. Um, small is uh, limit the gatherings to no more than three households, short two hours or less and stable. Really try to avoid multiple events uh, this season. And also we want our residents to know that testing is really accessible in this county. Uh, we know people um, uh, have struggled with that in, in over the summer, there were long wait times and it was difficult to get tested. That is not the case right now. Um, and testing is one of the main ways that we identify if we have cases and follow up on them quickly. So we do encourage our residents to get tested. Uh, our capacity has increased by 120% in terms of testing in the county since September. Uh, and our colleagues at Kaiser have been ramping up and also the state has been ramping up. So you really shouldn't hesitate uh, to get tested uh, if you have any concerns. Uh, so that was uh, one thing I wanted to start out with. The second thing is now really taking a look back. Um, I am so uh, proud of the response um, to the pandemic uh, in this county um, and in this region. And, and frankly, I don't think there's another place, really very few places in the entire United States uh, that have done a better job. And, uh, you know, if you had asked me uh, more than 13 years ago, as I sat with colleagues um, in a hotel here in the county, um, exercising our pandemic flu plan, uh, if I thought this reality would ever come to be, uh, I would have said yes, but I never would have anticipated the extent and the scale of it. Never would have done that. But my colleague at the time, uh, Health Officer Scott Morrow, uh, who you all know, he never blinked. And uh, I say that because I think it's really important for all of you to know that uh, th we are fortunate in San Mateo County to have a small group of relatively unsung heroes uh, in our public health division in county health uh, who avoid the limelight, uh, but they are steeped in the science uh, and the best practices uh, for responding to this sort of event. And they've been planning for it for years. Scott did not blink 13 years ago at the potential for this type of event, and he hasn't blinked in the last 10 months. Um, and actually this week uh, for the first time, you know, he's trying to take a little time off, but he's been just laser focused on it. And this is true uh, not only for our team here, but for our colleagues in our peer counties around the Bay Area who have years of experience managing communicable disease. And so when this, when this virus started to appear on the international landscape, we had a public health team monitoring the information out of the CDC on a daily basis, uh, engaged with our partners in the region, in California, and the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Um, unlike medicine, public health is really designed to protect the health of our entire community for just this scenario, for the challenge of communicable disease. And they're in the business of exercising very well understood public health strategies like testing, contact tracing and investigation, um, and uh, outreach and education in order to manage the, the spread. And so while this disease brought many unknowns, uh, and it will be years before we fully understand it, there was no question what the tools were to manage it. Uh, our public health teams chase TB, flu, norovirus, HIV, AIDS, year in and year out, coordinating with the state and the CDC. We confronted H1N1 and Ebola and many outbreaks over the years. So I'm really proud of the work that this core staff did, especially in the early days. And I don't think that the importance of this type of work is going to be forgotten very soon uh, by our residents. Uh, many of whom, you know, now track epidemiology and the spread of the disease, you know, on a daily basis. So my hope is that this experience, which we now recognize, will come to an end. The prospects um, are very, very positive with the new news that we've received about the vaccine and the, very, and the efficacy of it, uh, the strong, uh, the promise of a vaccine in the next year. Uh, my hope is that um, this experience will really gird our societal preparedness uh, for the things that come next. So I think that's all I'll say at the moment and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, one of our 
Progress Seminar co-chairs, Roseanne Faust, who is the president and CEO of SAMCEDA. And Roseanne, we know the, how, bad, how badly the business community has been hit, the tough things that have occurred, and um, how, have, how, I know, and see, talk a little bit about San Mateo Strong and what it's meant to the small business community, the medium-sized community, and your hopes and expectations for it. Thank you so much, Carol, um, Supervisor Groom. Really appreciate your support. I want to start with a number, and then I want to go back and make a few thank yous. 68 or $67.5 million. So folks, keep that in mind. $67.5 million as of October 30th, because it's already surpassed. $75 million. But let me start by going back to our county in March. So we were all humming along, 2% unemployment. Things were moving. Uh, there was not the equity that we have always hoped for. And boy, has this pandemic ripped that equity off for our small, medium size, especially minority owned businesses. But I wanna start with our County of San Mateo, the leadership of the Board of Supervisors and the leadership of Mike Callagy and his team, Peggy Jensen, Ileana Rodriguez and Justin Mates. They took this on and said, Samsita, will you join with us to be a conduit to the business community? And I've known Mike now for 20 years, and I don't think I've ever said no to him, and I certainly wasn't going to say no at that point in time. Then I want to turn to Louise Rogers and Dr. Scott Morrow and Sarija Srinivasan and Heather Forche at County Health. And just really hats off to them because we have hosted numerous webinars, numerous information sessions to really get out that what are the what does shelter in place mean? Let's remember, folks, we started with shelter in place and then we moved to the state four tiered system. And then we are now in the orange tier, which we would really like to say. But again, folks, it depends on all of us. It's about compliance and actually following rules and respecting others and allowing folks to wear your mask, put it on, keep six feet away from folks. We can do this in San Mateo County. I wanna thank our Chambers of Commerce, our Convention and Visitors Bureau, our nonprofits, the San Mateo Credit Union who joined with us for San Mateo County Strong, could not have done it without them, and our labor community. Because really, this is a partnership. So when I talked about $67.5 million, seven million Measure K funds, every single person on this progress seminar today has contributed to Measure K through sales tax dollars. 20.46 million in CARES Act funding from the federal government. I wanna thank our representatives, um, Congresswoman Speer and Eshoo. And then we were able to leverage an additional 40 million in leveraged funds through foundations, through our corporations, through our cities. The cities really stepped up to the plate. Back in the spring with San Mateo County Strong, we started with 350 $10,000 grants distributed countywide from Daly City in the north to Pacifica, Half Moon Bay and Pescadero on the coast side to East Palo Alto, Menlo Park and every one of our communities in between. Our city stepped up to the plate. So the Board of Supervisors gave 2 million to seed San Mateo County Strong. We were able to raise an additional 1.5 million through our cities. Cities actually, I wanna call out Milbrae, $100,000, Belmont, $100,000, Redwood City, 300,000, um, San Mateo, 400,000. I mean, all the cities that contributed to help our small business, then in the summertime, we realized that we needed to shift our focus slightly to look at minority uh, owned businesses in certain disadvantaged areas of the county. And I'm gonna use that term because those are our hardest to count census tracts. There are businesses that are just trying to survive. And we partnered with Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center. $200,000 was earmarked for them to allow an additional 
40 businesses to be helped at $5,000 levels. And I am so grateful the Board of Supervisors took another 2.5 million of CARES Act funding and we're working with Renaissance to deploy that again to the hardest hit zip code areas. But then on top of that, they gave another 1 million that we're looking to distribute countywide based on the remaining grant applications from the 1,200 that came to us in the spring because we weren't able to raise the money to help all of the businesses. So now we're going back. So think about it, folks. Our county, 750,000 people, and we were able to leverage and deploy for COVID relief funds 67.5 million as of October 30th. And I know Louise Rogers was quoted in the paper either this week or last week, and I know all the dates are starting to run together. Another six million from the board. I mean, this is pretty fantastic. I know folks tend to point to counties surrounding us and well, they raised this and they raised that, but you know what? We did pretty damn good folks and we need to keep it going because now it's crunch time. When you go into the small business, make sure you're not in a crowded setting. No bars, folks. You can get the white claws and drink them at home, okay? Or your wine or your preferred <laughs> bourbon or whatever. The gyms, keep far apart, okay? We, we're in it together and the mask wearing is important. So I have so much more I could say, but I wanted to get as much out in a short amount of time as possible. This has been a wild ride, and we aren't finished yet. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Or thank you, Roseanne. Louise or Mike, do you have anyone have things to add? Uh, I, I just like to echo, um, you know, Roseanne, I think, really is speaking about, you know, the power of the collaboration that has gone on in this county. And um, what I would observe uh, from having been in close touch with my colleagues in the other Bay Area counties who all have their great strengths, um, but there really is something that has happened here. And I think it's a part of our culture. And, and I really would like to credit uh, certainly our board and the, the city leaders, uh, but, but also Mike and Mike's uh, predecessor, John Maltby, um, there's a culture that we have uh, about working together. I often uh, describe our county as a medium-sized county that acts more like a small. And it's really evident in the response uh, to the pandemic. And what I really see is within sectors and across sectors, we have been collaborating since the early days to try to get the best kind of value to our residents, to our local businesses, and to the people who have been the most impacted by the pandemic. And I think, I think people know that 65% of our COVID cases, you know, have been uh, in our low income uh, communities of color and frontline workers. Um, so, but every step of the way, this partnership that I see, whether it's the SAMCEDA partnerships that, uh, that, that Roseanne just mentioned, or the San Mateo County uh, Recovery Initiative work, San Mateo County Strong, uh, where we've been looking at the longer term recovery uh, needs or within healthcare where we partner with all of our local healthcare uh, systems have been working together to be prepared for surge and all of that. These are things that are extremely powerful. And when I talk to my colleagues, frankly, they don't experience that kind of um, strength across and within the sector. So I just really want to appreciate uh, that and thank everyone who's on this um, in the seminar for the roles that you all have played in helping us uh, be strong together. And I'd like to follow it up, and, and it's well said, Louise, uh, with similar comments. Um, though this has been a tragedy of epic proportion, if, if there's one thing that has come out of this that, that, is, that is good, and many things uh, have come out, we have, become, we have become closer as a county. We were already a close county. And, and uh, as I speak to my, uh, my colleagues around the state, uh, they envy the relationship that we have. But when you talk about a board that's so in tune and working together uh, and distributing money where it's needed, it's just amazing. And then I look around at the elected officials uh, in this county to see what an amazing job. Not one of them, not one of them stepped off and to, to go in their own direction. 
every one of these elected officials in this county have been rowing in the same direction from day one, asking how they can help, how they can help further the county's mission here. Uh, and then you go to Sam Cedar. I can't say enough great things about Sam Cedar. The roles that they have filled and the things that we have requested from them from day one uh, is just uh, amazing. And, and Roseanne and her team have stepped up and filled every request we've had. And then you go to the CBOs who were stretched before, and they, they've gone the extra mile in every situation possible. And you throw in civil unrest and, and then the, the, the worst fires we've ever had in the history of this county. And you think how we've asked everyone time and time again to step up and, and give a little bit more. Without hesitation, they do it. And then to our private enterprise and all of you out there who have helped helped uh, in immeasurable ways. And even to those people, we stepped up in, in, the, in the early days and asked, look, we don't have enough PPE. Can you donate? And the people who came from everywhere, from every walk of life, from construction, tattoo parlors, beauty salons, every imaginable uh, business imaginable who dropped off PPE to help us through those critical times. I'm just so proud uh, of this county and the way we've reacted to this. We have a ways to go. But I can tell you, folks, we will get through this and we will get through this because of the people in this county and the relationships we have in this county. Has come in so far asking, uh, my, my children will be home from university before Thanksgiving. Where can I send them for testing? Well, we can start with, with Verily. We've got uh, them out there uh, uh, every day, uh, Tuesday through Saturday now at the event center, um, or there's lots of local, or you certainly you could uh, go through your own, um, your, your own health care provider to get that testing. Louise, do you have any other thoughts around that? Yeah, um, I've been really on top of this because of my own family. Curative um, is actually at the event center until 8 o'clock at night. And that can be very helpful if people have obligations during the day that are uh, difficult. And having four kids in college, I can tell you that uh, they've been there several times and uh, <laughs> it's painless, it's quick, it's easy. Okay, um, do we have any more questions rolling into us? Not right now. Not right now. Uh, what else would you, what else would any of you like to add? Yeah, I would just like to, uh, to go back to what we can do to, to, to get through this. I, I think the next six weeks are absolutely critical. And uh, we have recently put together a COVID-19 compliance team. We have got to get that message out there. We want businesses to stay open to the extent that they can, but we have got to safeguard the public in doing that. So we're asking all businesses, and we're asking all of you to help us get the word out that um, they have got to comply with the regulations, especially on the indoor dining. That's what we're most concerned about for the restaurants, the indoor gyms. That's what we're concerned about, um, the hotels uh, and the bars. Those are the areas that really can act as super spreaders if, in fact, they don't follow the guidelines. Um, but we are there. The COVID-19 compliance team is out there daily on a regular basis, really working with businesses to make sure that they have uh, the tools and information necessary to keep not only themselves and their employees safe, but really the public that's going to be coming in uh, and utilizing their services. Um, and to the extent that, that you see businesses that are not compliant, we ask you, to report them. And, and uh, our folks don't go out there and hammer them. They go out there very nice and, and really talk to them in a way that to help them understand that it's in all of their best interests. It's in all of our interest if they comply with the regulations that are so necessary to stay open and for us to get through the next six to weeks to two months. Louise, on the, on the uh, news last night and again this morning, there was lots of comments about hospitals around the United States at capacity. What's, how does San Mateo County li line up with that? Well, um, you know, we have really, really been tightly coordinated with our hospital partners um, on the peninsula as, as well as in the region. And the capacity has been very strong, um, even in the, uh, the greatest upticks that we've had in earlier phases of the pandemic, um, we have not maxed out on capacity. Um, I should also just acknowledge that the greater challenge are always related to staffing, not so much about beds and staffing. Um, and you know, at, we we haven't we haven't had problems there. We've been able to navigate through it um, in every uh, preceding wave. PPE also has been a challenge in the past, and 
It remains a challenge for medical grade uh, N95 masks, um, but most other PPE issues have been, um, the, the supply chain issues have been resolved. So we are feeling very good about the hospital capacity um, on the peninsula. And um, I'm hopeful that if the numbers uh, go up further, um, which of course we hope they won't through a great collective effort to avoid gatherings, um, but I'm hopeful that our hospitals, uh, you know, will be able to, to will be able to function. We are looking at all of the different things that we need to do be, to be prepared for an uptick. Everything. I mean, we're looking at PPE. We're looking at hotel rooms and having sufficient capacity. We're looking at having adequate contact tracers in the bank. We're looking at testing. All of those issues to be prepared uh, for a surge. What, Louise, why don't you talk a little bit about contact tracing and what, what it entails, how, how, how many people you've got at it and what they're doing? I think, I think that would be an okay. interest, interesting thing to learn. Yeah. So um, as people would expect, we receive reports of positive cases. Uh, we receive the lab results uh, quickly. Um, anytime there's a positive case of a San Mateo County resident, uh, we learn their results, even if they're not physically uh, in San Mateo County, if, if they're, they're somewhere else, we, we hear the results. Um, and we assign a, a person, a contact tracer, to contact the person, um, and they do that through various means, um, and to follow up with them regarding, um, first of all, what they're doing to isolate, to make time. sure they understand what's needed to isolate and protect others, which may include their family members and others but also to learn who they've been in touch with um, in the last day or so, so that we can follow up with those people, uh, their contacts, and uh, assess to what degree they may be at risk themselves for the virus. Um, and if they meet certain criteria, uh, then we ask them also to quarantine uh, for 14 days. Um, we connect people with testing um, because often that's necessary. And then I think most importantly, and it's very important for our public to know, we have um, a team that helps people in the event that they really don't have uh, the wherewithal to isolate. They have trouble uh, isolating in their own home or they may be living in a very crowded housing situation. They may need a hotel room. They may have financial obligations that are very difficult uh, to meet if they're not working and they may be reluctant to not go to work. They may not be paid if they don't go to work. Um, and so we've also been offering, uh, we've paid people's rent. Um, we've offered wage replacement. Uh, we've paid for food and groceries to be delivered uh, during the period of their isolation. Um, and we've supported them around the needs of family members in the household uh, who may re rely on the person or people uh, to be able to get by during the, um, during the period of isolation and quarantine. So we recognize that if we can't help people uh, isolate once they're positive, uh, we're not going to get a grip on the virus. And so that's a key focus. Thank you. I can't see that first question. Carol, if I could just say something about testing also, you know, I'm just so proud of the testing team because that has been such an important part of our strategy uh, in moving through the tiers. Um, if we didn't have that, there would be nothing that we could do to, to really move out of purple. Um, and just a, a real shout out to uh, Justin Mates, Deputy County Manager, for all he's done in that regard with all our partners uh, in the medical field to really increase by over 100% um, the testing in just six weeks. That has allowed us to advance through the, the, the tiers, and we've tried to really make sure that, that we got into those hard-to-reach neighborhoods and have a easily accessible testing uh, for them. Um, and we've moved to something that was unfathomable to begin with. Uh, when we started this, we thought there was no way that we could have, you know, 500 tests uh, per 100,000 every day. And uh, they are exceeding that right now. So I'm going to encourage all of you to keep, uh, keep testing. It helps us. We've uh, just about reached the max on the benefit, and we want to stay there. Uh, because all that testing provides us with really good data points to really understand uh, and track uh, this, uh, this disease in our, in our community, um, but while also allowing us to really focus on areas that need more attention. So we're going to ask people to continue to get tested as we uh, transition through uh, the next several months here. Okay. 
We have a question about masks. Um, and when it, when, the question is, when it comes to wearing masks, I wear mine all the time, but other people don't seem to think they need to. And others don't seem to be worried that, uh, about the hospitalization count. So, you know, we, we, we preach wearing masks all the time, but um, is what, 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 is a, what, what would be a, a, a new mess, a different message maybe to use? I, I could add a couple of things. Um, yes, uh, masks are super important. Um, and even very recently, um, the CDC offered guidance about wearing uh, face coverings even in the home. Um, you know, especially when you are um, when you have family members who may be um, out and about quite a lot, and you may have other family members who are vulnerable and you know older. Um, and so the message about face coverings really has, uh, over time, been this is one of the most important strategies, if not the most important strategy, aside from physical distance of six feet or more, that we could use to uh, prevent the spread. And so the state also is highly focused on it. Um, they are coming out uh, very soon with uh, updated guidance, uh, guidance related to sports and youth sports in particular, that will have um, uh, a strong component uh, related to um, masks. Um, and so I think we, we all need to do the easiest thing that we can do. It's within everyone's ability to do it, it which is to wear masks frequently. Now, in, in, in some communities, um, there's, a, there's a lot of guidance focused on even at restaurants when you're not eating, literally when you're not eating, um, that face coverings uh, can um, also be very helpful. Um, and, and so just minimizing the time when you're in close proximity with others uh, when you're not wearing a face covering. And Supervisor Grimm, also we do have that mass mobile out there. I think it was, uh, we're one of the first uh, to ever uh, in the state get a mass mobile out there and they're out there on a regular basis and especially in those uh, hard to reach neighborhoods um, distributing masks. And it's funny, I, I think that as we look back on this and Louise talked about this, over the years we're gonna learn a lot about this this uh, this pandemic and, and some of the things we did right, some of the things that we should have done earlier. And I think one of those things as we reflect back uh, over time, um, there'll be a realization that maybe we should have started wearing masks and mandated the uh, wearing masks on a national basis uh, much, much earlier and that many deaths and, the, and illnesses could have been prevented um, if we had done that. So that's something that uh, we'll be looking at over time. Uh, we have a comment uh, from uh, John Hutar from the Visitors and Convention Bureau about the West Coast governors uh, asking for quarantine if you're if be, before you uh, after your travel. What do you do? You have a comments on that? Well, I would just note that since we have an airport, you know, local locally, and and we are in an area where we have a lot of travelers, both for business and and for uh, personal reasons, that that the issue of travel is, it's very significant. Um, we know there are risks. Um, what I would do, what I would say just to embellish on, on that is um, we know it isn't always possible and that's you know, where it's so important that testing, you know, that te we know testing is now widely accessible, getting more widely accessible. So people I think should really think about um, their, their travel, um, if they're going to travel, um, certainly to try to avoid it, but when it's unavoidable, really think about testing. Okay, good, good, thank you. Um, how have the experiences and lessons of the last few months changed and how would you approach chronic ongoing crises in San Mateo County in the future? Well, let me just start by saying, uh, unfortunately, we've become experts at this overnight. Um, we have had crisis upon crisis crisis within crisis, um, when you look at just the overall pandemic and, and, and what that has caused in and of itself, not only managing the illness in, in COVID-19, but the ensuing um, loss of jobs, loss of, of, of wages, loss of homes, loss of businesses, and trying to combat that along with the loss of revenue to the county. Um, and then you take into consideration in the middle of this, we had civil unrest uh, with George Floyd uh, in, in incident um, and, and people wanting to voice their opinion in the middle of a pandemic. And then you take on top of that 
um, the crisis of uh, mass evacuations and, and uh, houses being lost in, in one of the worst uh, wildfires we've ever had uh, in this county. Um, and I got to say that, that uh, our folks uh, have become experts at this. Never in the history of this county have we had a sustained effort for this long keeping an EOC, an emergency operations center, open. Uh, and operational um, with all the moving parts associated with that. And I got to tell you that every single day, a new crisis is born within this crisis uh, that uh, that demands immediate attention. And everyone, and you look around again, I can't stress how our board and the elected officials have stepped up around this county time and time again with all our CBOs and all our partners in business to really respond to this in so many different ways. I'll talk about the hotels, how they threw their doors open um, when we needed it for COVID or when we needed it for evacuations for, for fires. I mean, they're just amazing. I mean, so many giving people who want to help. We, we were able to gather 1,200 volunteers virtually overnight at the beginning of this pandemic for people with, uh, you know, certainly disregarding their own safety who wanted to help in some fashion. That's what makes this county special. And uh, we will learn, and, and someday when we have a time to breathe, we will debrief all of this and uh, we will be a better organization. We will be a better county because of the way we came together. Um, none of us here are school board members, but we do have a question about the when, being able to get the schools open, get the kids back into class, and uh, what, what, what parameters might be for safety. Carol, I'm going to, um, before we answer that question, yes. I just want to piggyback on what Mike had said, because um, from a business community perspective, one of the things that we learned early on was to encourage the small and medium sized businesses. Larger businesses are a little better at this, but it was to take stock of what they had control over in the short term and then have them assess where they needed help. And I think from our perspective and looking backwards, people wanted when we gave $10,000 grants in April and May, we thought this would be finished by the summer. And when you reflect back, you the best advice we gave the business community at the time is cut your expenses to the absolute bone. Conserve your cash, figure out what exactly you need to do yourself in the first four, six, eight weeks, and then figure out where we, and I say a collective we, because this is the chambers, this is Sam Cita, this is all of labor, all of us working together. What did they need from us going forward? Was it PPE equipment? Was it technology? Was it HR? Was it something else that none of us had thought about? So I think when you think about how do you deal with a crisis, it's what can you do within your ecosystem? And then how do you leverage that? And then how do you look at your kind of pebble in the pond mentality? I posted some things in the chat. I would encourage everyone to go to smcrecovery.org because again, I will say this county is so unique in terms of tracking and data management. There is a lot of good data there and they just keep updating it. And they actually shored up that website in less than two months time. That's unheard of. And then I also put a link to the San Mateo County Strong Investor Report. And I would have you all visit smcstrong.org and look at the different relief funds that are still going out for small property owners, for childcare. I mean, millions of dollars to our child care center and our family child care. Because, and this kind of leads into the answer to the school question, is unless we can get our child care and after school, and a lot of times when we talk about child care, we focus on zero to five, but we also have to have our boys and girls club, our after school enrichment programs, whatever they may be, to be open so that parents can return to work and that's working from home or it's going into an office. And, and then um, Nancy McGee has been an absolute rock star in terms of coordinating with our, we have 23 school districts in San Mateo County. So uh, there has been, 
definitely been some splits as to whether we continue doing distance learning and it works for some children, doesn't work for others. So that's where our after school providers. I mean, I'm gonna call out Aubrey Merriman with the Boys and Girls Club of Northern San Mateo County. I mean, he's done a banner job of switching their programs to be able to accommodate parents' work schedules and the after school. Um, I don't know if Mike and Louise wanna comment on, school is a very touchy subject and I, I, I've learned that and tried not to step into it too much. <laughs> I have thoughts and I think parents have thoughts and I think teachers have thoughts and I think kids have thoughts and we have a whole bunch of people with thoughts and <laughs> parents on a rampage are scary. So Mike, I'm gonna throw that to you. Well, I mean, thank goodness it's out of my um, realm of uh, expertise <laughs> and oversight. So we really uh, we really rely uh, and partner with, uh, with Nancy McGee uh, in the districts out there. But I can say that we are playing a part of, uh, and, and the board has really stepped up to play a major part of a gap of uh, really filling that gap of the digital divide and, and trying to get, uh, to trying to make sure that the most vulnerable uh, kids out there are, are getting the tools that they need to be able to thrive uh, in this virtual world that we're living right now of teaching. So that has been a, a major step and a major partnership with us in the school district. And I, I don't know, as far as the safety, Louise, I don't know if you have anything to add there. All I would add, you know, I think the County Office of Ed led by Nancy has just done a great job of creating a framework for all of the schools at each level to plug into, um, you know, that meets their, their needs. But, you know, what I would just say is we have dozens of schools that are, that are doing um, in-person learning with, with mitigations. Um, and, you know, so far it's gone really, really well. It really has. And um, I think that um, we have the tools for the school communities to be able to operate at whatever their comfort level is and to keep people safe. And we work very closely with education, the County Office of Ed, literally on a daily basis. Um, and what I observe is that it's, it's going well. Um, you know, it, it is a process and there are many, many different concerns and feelings, but I think um, we do have a good start in place and we just really need to keep working it in the coming months. And if I could just piggyback on that and reiterate again that uh, at the event center, we have curative out there um, who uh, is really doing family testing from you know, five years old and above, but will test the whole family in that line. <clears throat> and I know many schools are putting that information out uh, to their families that, you, you know, please get your kids checked on a, on a regular basis. And uh, we do have availability there. So please uh, utilize that uh, as much as uh, possible. And we, we're, we certainly would like to amplify that to, to the school age kids. The, uh, we talk, we've talked a little bit earlier about Thanksgiving and uh, the, the fact that will be, families will be gathering. And um, I, if you saw in the, the news last night, Dr. Fauci has said that his family is not going to get together for Thanksgiving, you know, which is, which is sad, but probably wise at the same time. And uh, Louise, your health department has published um, through, a, through a, a guidelines for, Louis, for uh, Thanksgiving. And uh, I think there's, I think uh, our, our social media people put them out on Facebook this morning. So if you look up Facebook and Thanksgiving, you'll see um, lots of tips for how you can have a safe and happy holiday. Do you want to add anything to that, Louise? You know, the only thing that I would add is that, you know, this has been a long haul and I know people's patience has worn thin and we, we really want to see our loved ones. I, I haven't seen my mother, you know, since uh, January of last year, right before the pandemic. And I, it's, it's really, really hard. But what I want to say is that, you know, we're at a point in this where if we all buckle down and hang together and try to minimize gathering that's risky, you know, the end is in sight. You know, the end is in sight. And, and we, we just need to keep our eyes on the horizon uh, with the vaccine and the new year and try to uh, get through the holidays uh, recognizing that the end is in sight. And I hope, I just hope that gives people a little more hope, you know, um, to be able to weather what has, um, you know, been very, very difficult for everyone. 
Uh, we have a question now. Would like to, uh, she would love to see a more regional and coordinated approach to bridging the digital divide rather than so many organizations filling in the gaps as best they can given their resources. Who could be the best organization to convene everyone to share resources and coordinate regionally? Well, we're actually doing that through uh, John Walton and ISD and uh, uh, Nancy McGee uh, and the superintendents. Um, they have uh, sat down, they've identified where the greatest needs, needs are in the digital divide. And uh, we are rolling out those devices and, and uh, the Wi-Fi necessary for, for those kids. Uh, and, you know, it'd be great if we had a, a, a built out system throughout the entire county for free Wi-Fi everywhere, but it's so costly uh, and it would be uh, time prohibitive. We need kids to have these devices now so that they can keep up and not lose time with, uh, with their classmates and not fall behind. Um, so we've uh, got a pretty good uh, structure in place there. The, the, the board has allocated uh, a lot of money towards this um, and uh, we're rolling that out. And in fact, I was just talking to our, uh, the John Walton, who's the director of ISD um, and uh, last night, and he was saying that uh, uh, they're on their way to, uh, to really making great inroads here by the end of the year. Roseanne, how about the business community and the digital capacity and the, the, the communication and information networks? So it's really one of the most exciting things that SAMCEDA is involved with. We are a part of the team that Mike talked about with Nancy McGee and John Walton. And really, we looked at it in short term. Whatever child doesn't have access and needs it now, there's your focus. So that needed to be done. And then medium term in terms of how do you deploy what's already existing out there? Um, and uh, Mary Louise Despain, and I probably, I, I think uh, I might have her first name wrong, but she's Anne, head of the county library system. Anne, Mar Anne Marie. Anne Marie. Anne Marie is fantastic. And libraries throughout the county, those independent um, affiliated with cities or the county library system, they have used the technology and public Wi-Fi. And so we are working to understand what already exists because when you think about a countywide public Wi-Fi system, you think first it'll benefit the children, but then you think about our small businesses, our minority owned businesses that really need that connectivity. Then you think about them. Then you think about our seniors and you start to look at the ecosystem. So Sancita is talking with the county council's office about what type of financial mechanisms or legislation or whatever would we need in place to think about this countywide? What would be the upfront construction costs associated with it? And then what would be the ongoing maintenance and operation? Because we can all have a great system with hotspots and the mobile units that John Walton and his team have deployed. We can have the, the Comcast and the AT&Ts and the Verizons put things on our light poles and look at our downtowns. But that requires ongoing maintenance and operations. And there is a cost associated with that. And are we willing to come together as 20 cities in a county and figure out how to fund that? And how do we get the corporations to pay in, to buy in, and to support it? Because it would really benefit everyone. So this is a very multi-layered and complex situation, but it is one that we are very excited about and more to come on it, folks. And I know there was a question on work plans, how to get folks to return to work. And it comes back to Louise and Mike have really set the tone. It is the health and safety of everyone. And once we have that under control and that means a vaccine and that means work plans and work sites that folks are going to have the consumer confidence to actually go back into. And there are some great plans out there. The CDC has put out plans. The state of California has put out plans. Sam Cita does a daily news briefing. Anything from McKinsey, I would really encourage you to look at. They have fantastic office reconfiguration plans. They're being done. They're being done in Silicon Valley. They're being done in our area. We're smart folks, and if we kind of co pull those collective ideas from really trusted sources, and then you build the consumer confidence for the employees to go back to the office, 
to ride public transit. I'm going to do a, I mean, public transit has been doing a phenomenal job of health and safety on our buses, on our trains, at the airport. I mean, I've had to fly several times during the last months for different reasons, and I felt very safe. Our airlines, I mean, they have really done an incredible job, but it is building up the consumer confidence. I'm much more confident getting on a plane or getting in a train, frankly, than I am walking into a crowded restaurant where people aren't respecting social distancing. So, but again, we encourage the restaurants because we want people to keep the economy going. So there's a lot of levels and layers to this. And I could just follow up by also saying that, you know, of, of the 7,500 full and part-time employees we have here at the county, uh, we've got about 60% of those back to work and we're doing it in a safe uh, manner that uh, safeguards the public and, and safeguards uh, our employees. And that's paramount to us. And it really is creating that uh, social distancing and the barriers that are necessary and making sure there's there are sanitation stations uh, around um, and that people continue to wear masks. You're not allowed in the building without a mask on. You're not allowed to work without a mask on. Um, those are all the things that we're going to have to consider. And, and, and Roseanne's gr uh, right. There's some great models out there. Um, and we've been doing this from day one. And thank goodness uh, we, we have not uh, had a lot of people uh, report in uh, with COVID. I was going to ask you to do a follow up on the working from home uh, and pe people leaving the offices working from home and what the health to health benefits or non benefits of that. Well, I just say the health benefit is my my uh, my mental uh, sanity uh, in what used to take me a 50 minute commute to go four miles. It now takes me about four minutes. So that's one great benefit from it. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it's something that, that we're going to look at, um, quite frankly, uh, on an ongoing basis. We know that we have uh, units and departments that can uh, work remotely, that we believe that we can shuffle people in and out. Uh, we were looking at this, quite frankly, uh, extensively before COVID-19 was struck. But we had to flip a switch overnight and decompress the entire workforce uh, by almost 75% with all the technology and everything else that was needed. Uh, and we're working effectively in many cases remotely now. And we continue, we'll continue to explore that uh, well after COVID-19. Many lessons learned here during COVID-19. Roseanne, what are you hearing? I'd like to add we, on to that. Um, yes. In terms of the value to our community, I mean, I, I think we're certainly seeing that uh, there are some silver linings to this experience. And one of them, of course, is uh, learning how to telework and pivot really quickly. Um, but there's also been a lot of value in speaking now in terms of health and the roles that we play with our community for our clients. There have been a number of examples where it's been of greater service um, to our clients and residents uh, than the way we were working previously. So one example would be um, we did not have telemedicine um, fully mm. ramped up mm. previously. Um, and now we, we really do. And we're seeing that this is a great service to our patients for whom getting into a clinic uh, is a great challenge and maybe very time consuming. And then the second area would be with our, our WIC program where we're focused on um, young parents and their, their newborn children and, and having nutrition benefits. We've actually had a massive uptick in that service because we now make it accessible. Uh, via the telephone. So anyway, I'm thinking that this is something that we absolutely want to continue where we've had uh, actually better results for residents. Roseanne, uh, work at, working at home, getting out of the cars? For sure. I mean, from uh, greenhouse gas emissions, from a commute patterns, from a health perspective, if people really separate from their commute computer and take a 30 minute walk outside during the day, uh, one of the things, and I want to finish answering that, but there's a great return to work playbook that Kaiser Permanente has done. We've actually, Samsita has hosted a webinar for Kaiser and the Chambers, and that's posted in the chat. But the work from home, one of the things that we are monitoring very closely is folks' mental health and really looking at that because um, myself and, and my team, because we are small, have been able to come into the office. And so we've had much, many more meetings than we otherwise would have because you're not driving back and forth. So you have to find things, and Dr. Josie really talked about this this morning, to separate yourself 
to have a break from work, to find those moments of peace and comfort, to actually recognize that not everyone handles the work from home situation the same. Some people feel that they can't get a break, that they can't take a break, that they're constantly on. And and I think, I mean, have a little more patience with people, have a little more kindness to them and empathy because people handle things very differently. And I think sometimes we forget that if, if, you know, there's a bunch of type A people, both attending the progress seminar and as panelists and type A people tend to just roll with stuff. I mean, that's, that's just the nature of it, but there are other folks that really are struggling. Pick up the phone, check on your neighbors, check on your seniors, check on your colleagues, actually. I find myself reaching out to colleagues where I just know that maybe this isn't as easy for them. And it is and it is that empathy, compassion, patience, and recognition that we all don't, don't handle this quite the same. And some people, you know, you just need... A smile and a kind word goes incredibly far. Very true. We have a couple more minutes. Um, would any of you like to add anything that we have not spoken about today or, or sum up some thoughts and uh, about, about uh, what, what's facing us for the next couple of months? Uh, I would just like to, to end by saying thank you to everyone. Thank you to Louise. Thank you to Roseanne. Thank you to the board, all the elected officials in this county, all our, our CBO partners who have done such an incredible job, uh, and all those in the private industry who have really held the front line and, and really um, tried to work through this the best way they, they, they can. I mean, this was a surprise to all of us, and I think that we were surprised, at least I am, by some of the businesses that did not make it through this, uh, some of the businesses that we assumed be around forever, um, but went via uh, COVID-19 and it's, it's tragic and, and the lives have been lost is really tragic. But so much collaboration has taken place. It, it just reinforces to me that we can get through anything when we work together and uh, we are so much stronger together. Um, and, and I really believe because of this experience, we will be a better, stronger county uh, and we will um, do great things together with the elected officials in this county and all the resources that we've been able to pull together and really become experts at uh, putting to practice. Louise? Yeah, I mean, I just to echo what Mike has said, uh, I, I really hope that we can all leave this um, crisis with uh, to sh sharing the same resolve, uh, which is to... Um, Think about the themes that have come out of our recovery planning and, and really together resolve to lift up the children, the, the workers, and the families that have been uh, most impacted by this. Um, this. This county has had incredible strength, um, and we know that this is a setback. Um, and I think if we apply the same collective will to the recovery, uh, really to focus on, I, I'm very focused on kids. Um, in particular, I, I, we all know it's third grade literacy uh, that is going to be so important for the workforce of our future and for the wellness of our overall county. So I'm just hopeful that we can share the same resolve um, as we come out of this. Roseanne? And I want to thank I want to, first of all, I echo everything Mike said and everything that Louise said. I mean, those are two of my personal heroes. So I'm just going to say that here and now. I want to thank our board of supervisors because they set the tone and then we all collectively jumped in. But I do want to say a special thank you to the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce because for over 50 years, they've been doing the progress seminar. And we are so grateful. And 22 years ago, I walked into a meeting at their old offices um, in Redwood City, and I met Larry Buckmaster. And Larry and Joan Buckmaster are incredible people. And they always talked about the San Mateo County way and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think about them so often, every day and they and the leadership program of Redwood City really set me on my tra trajectory. I started working on childcare issues because 
I had a three-year-old and actually at the time she wasn't born yet, <laughs> but a second daughter came along. And I think about those beginnings and I just want to pay tribute and thanks to the Redwood City San Mateo County Chamber and the Buckmaster family and the leadership under Amy now. So thank you. Yes, I think the progress seminar is, is something that others in the others have tried to replicate, um, and have had taken our ideas of this of this progress seminar and moved it. And you know, nothing can be stronger or better than learning about our, the community in which we live. It's just the, the best way that we can be contributors to our community. And so, with that, let me thank Roseanne Faust from Sam Cita, Louise Rogers from the San Mateo County Health Department, and Mike Callagy, the county manager. And um, thank you all for joining us today. This, this has been part two of Progress Seminar Virtual. Next Friday, at tw we will begin again with, the th with part three. And so um, please be safe, please be well, and um, be kind. Thanks for joining us this morning. <laughs>